Awesome, that is now recording. Um, so we are delighted to have Belinda Smale with us here today. Um, Belinda is a professor of film and screen studies at Monash University, and she's been researching non-fiction and documentary screen culture for more than two decades. Recently, her work has focused on the ethical, cultural, and institutional issues that pertain to the presentation of the environment and biodiversity on screen. Uh, she is the author of several books, including uh, the documentary Politics, Emotion, and Culture, and Regarding Life, Animals, and the Documentary Moving Image, which I'm sure Ruby would be very interested in. <laughs> um, she's currently lead investigator on the ARC-funded project, Remaking the Australian Environment Through Documentary Film uh, and Television. Uh, and we're delighted to have Belinda with us today. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, I'll just note that I'm speaking from the lands of the Boonarong people here in um, Nam. And before I go any further, I'm just going to attempt to share my screen so you can see my slides. I hope that's visible now. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, yes, well, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be presenting to this group because I am really interested in environmental history, even though I don't think of myself as an environmental historian, but it will be great to get to get your feedback on this on this work. So the project, um, so the study I'm going to present today is part of the um, the ARC project, the discovery project that Jess just mentioned. And this particular study is uh, drawn from, well, the, what I will present today is part of a longer piece that's forthcoming in the Journal of Cinema and Media Studies next year. Um, so I will also say before I start properly that I'm recovering from a cold. So if I'm <laughs> a bit hoarse and uh, stopping to cough and splutter a bit, please <laughs> bear with me. Um, okay, so the study, um, the broader project that the study comes from, uh, investigates the relation between nonfiction film culture and the Australian environment since 1945. The project, I think, re represents the first time Australian film history and its archives have been examined through an environmental lens in a sustained way. And there's still much more to do. The archive is really large. Um, but I've been particularly interested in charting key moments in which ideas about nature, wilderness, environment have been variously deployed, affirmed, and or contested in public film culture, particularly before and during uh, the feature film revival of the 1970s. So... I begin uh, this talk by gesturing to two seemingly unrelated spheres of activism that were underway at the outset of the 1970s in Australia. Environmental activism was finding new momentum and at the same time, lobbying for government support for a national film industry was soon to spur the Australian film renaissance. So we know a lot about how in the 1970s, a new culture of narrative feature film exemplified by Picnic at Hanging Rock, My Brilliant Career, looked to the Australian bush in the outback as it formulated a distinctive quality national cinema. While the cinema tied national identity and colonial identity specifically to the landscape, filmmakers and activists interested in documentary, at least in part, turned to the natural world in a different way, politicizing images and contesting uses of the environment that had come before. And that's what I'm wanting to talk about today is this, what I see as a pivotal moment. So as a documentary studies scholar, I'm really interested in the often more marginalized histories of nonfiction filmmaking. Of course, there's been really interesting work done on uh, uh, documentary uh, culture of the 20th century in Australia, but I think there's there's a lot that hasn't been looked at. Um, and in this talk, I want to chart not only the films that supported the campaign to save the Franklin River, and a film that was made at the very outset of this campaign, The Last Wild River, which I'm going to focus on uh, especially, 
But I also want to think about how they mark a shift away from depictions of resource extraction that were widespread in mid 20th century filmmaking that was dominated by an ethos of nation building. So <clears throat> for this talk, I'd like to spend a fair bit of time talking through my approach and the historical background for this study, because I think it might be uh, interesting to this audience and it might be a, an interesting point of discussion. So cinema, including its production and circulation, forms part of cultural histories that, when examined, can show how societies relate to and change in tandem with the environment over time. Despite this, there's been still too little examination of how film has been tied into environmental change, especially in Australia. So I'm interested in sites, historical sites that do this and in, in the film culture that, that, uh, that kind of comes along with this. So in this respect, the idea of the film event is a simple but very generative notion. Renowned film historian Thomas Alsacer develops an approach to studying archives of nonfiction film that accounts for the three contingencies of one, the commissioning body, two, the concrete occasion for which the film was produced, and three, the target uses or audience. And this idea of the film event, I think it can include, but lessens the emphasis on textual reading strategies. So accounting for the event can determine the relation of one film to another. This is Alsace's uh, words, one film to another and help to understand its place in wider histories. I draw on Alsace's work because he was interested not in entertainment cinema, but utilitarian or useful film, a point that I'll return to in a moment. I think there's a lot to be gained by extending this notion of the film event with considerations of how the more than human is not simply a backdrop um, or an arena to be acted upon, but rather as a partner in the production of film historical events and representations. So it plays an, an, an active role and I'm interested in, in how this might occur. Outlining the category of what they term useful cinema, um, Charles Ackland and Heidi Wasson are well known for their work um, and they describe film that is deployed variously beyond questions of art and entertainment in order to satisfy organizational demands and objectives, that is to do something in particular. They refer to a body of films and technologies that perform tasks and serve as instruments in an ongoing struggle for aesthetic, social, and political capital. So they're talking about uh, really instrumental kinds of film that's, that's obviously designed to do something for organizations rather than as commercial products that will make money. My interpretation of their category includes examples that might otherwise be considered activist or campaign documentary, because I think there's an interesting dialogue in play here. And this allows me to offer a wider investigation, one that explores how different groups and institutions use documentary film to instrumentalize images of the environment in a manner that played out in competing ways over time. So the films I discuss uh, that I kind of bring into this category were all designed as instruments to influence, you know, perhaps attitudes and behaviors, which is why the rationale for their production is so interesting to me. It, it, they can convey a lot about what was happening in this moment, especially in uh, government corporations and others who used these films in particular ways, but also, as I'll talk about, activist organizations. So that's a bit about my approach there. And now I'd like to talk more about uh, or get on to what I was uh, the main aim of this paper, which is to place in dialogue government sponsored film and early campaign or activist film. Um, and I will be getting to the up to ideas of extraction for those um, who are interested in that, because I realize this is the series uh, topic for the talk. 
So mid-century documentary. Um, as this audience will be aware, I'm sure, um, the post-war boom in Australia and its reliance on primary resources is really a key uh, uh, kind of set of ideas for thinking about the environment in the 20th century. This period saw the substantial expansion of hydroelectric projects and the intensification of land clearing for agriculture and forestry. This was followed in the 1960s by the resources boom and the growth of mining for iron ore, uranium, bauxite, etc. That's a very sketchy outline of, of some of the important um, characteristics of this time. So I gesture to Emory Seaman's broadest use of the term extraction to describe practices that extract value from the environment for the operations of modern societies. That's a quote from Seaman. While usually altering the environment in uh, highly destructive ways. So extraction in this respect is a really a non-reciprocal relationship. It's simply about taking. Post-war reconstruction in many places, including Australia, was facilitated in part uh, by a newly relevant documentary culture that was deployed by government and to a lesser extent corporations to reflect images of the contemporary nation, its specificity and challenges back to the citizenry. So as the most prevalent genre of post-war film production in Australia in the 1970s, until the 1970s, documentary assisted in the ongoing normalization of the natural world as a resource available for extraction. Nevertheless, it did so in ways that were diverse in theme and style. There wasn't just one kind of documentary filmmaking. There was actually uh, a number of phases and movements and some incredibly um, interesting filmmaking made over this period. So on the uh, slide there, I have a few notes about uh, some of the moves that were occurring in the post-war period in terms of film culture. We have the Australian National Film Board established in 1945. Uh, we have Royal Dutch Shell who set up their first very successful film unit in, outside London in Australia in 1948. And there I have an image on the screen of um, one of Shell's mobile film vans that allowed them to show films in remote locations as uh, kind of driving out to the outback and setting up screens outside. And of course, a film and photographic unit was established for the Snowy Mountain Hydro Scheme between 1949 and 1974, which was highly uh, productive um, and produced quite a few films. Okay, so these were all kind of involved in presenting nation building projects to the Australian public. So in terms of this post-war culture, Albert Moran and Tom O'Regan write that at the outset of this time, uh, advocates outlined a particular role for documentaries specifically. And I've got a quote here where they talk about um, some of the advocacy around how film should help the post-war um, reconstruction pro project. And I like this quote for a number of reasons, um, but I'll read it now. Uh, it was felt that such a film should help to construct a unified nation by showing one part of the country to other parts. It was to focus on the kinds of social problems facing a particular part of the nation and would show how these were being overcome. It needed to get away from cliches, so cliches of previous filmmaking, including kangaroos, koala bears, and fields of waving wheat, and had instead to focus on elements of Australia and the national experience not usually seen. In any case, the film should not have been studio bound, but rather it was to be shot on location. And of course it had to be documentary. So this, um, this uh, kind of model that they're advocating is based a lot on the eyes of John Grierson, a British um, film advocate. 
But I'm interested also in these, in these ideas because I think we can think about them specifically in relation to what that means in terms of the, the Australian continent and its specificity. So while not explicitly stated here, if documentary film was to engage with the whole of the nation in innovative ways, it needed to account for the substantial biotic and geophysical variation that characterizes the Australian continent. A preference for on-location shooting was to help capture this variation. The films that resulted were imbued with the decisions based on more than singularly human concerns. And um, they, had to, they were, had to reflect on what was possible. Not all parts of the landmass could be easily accessed by film crews or by those wanting to distribute films. Um, and they had, it had to be novel, so not more kangaroos, which obviously were not considered to be novel enough at the time. And thematically, films were optimistic and celebratory. And as Moran writes, the sense of things improving and changing for the better is directly linked in many of the films dealing with the physical environment to an ideology of development. Here, natural resources are there for the taking. So over this time, uh, you know, there are many titles that we could look at in the archive. But here's, here's a few that I've pointed out here. Um, and Oil, Our Hidden Wealth, The Earth Reveals, Power from the Snowy. Uh, and also, you know, kind of omnibus films that celebrated the potential of several natural resources, such as Northwest Horizon in um, Western Australia. So, yeah, a, a really significant part of the archive in a federal sense. But I want to turn my focus now uh, to Tasmania because I think that there's a really interesting set of relationships uh, to be kind of uh, elaborated here, as well as a really interesting archive. And I want to show a clip in a moment from, from a film in the archive. So while film historians have focused their attention on the federal film institutions that I've talked about um, just now, especially the, uh, the, the National Film Board and the Commonwealth Film Unit, the Tasmanian Government Film Unit was one of a number of state film units that haven't had as much attention. Now, the Tasmanian Government Film Unit was established in 1946. Uh, in 1960, it became the Department of Film Production and was governed by its own board until it closed in 1977. And I think that archived papers and films from this unit are the most intact of any state unit uh, and offer a really rich resource. Film production in the TDFP emphasised utility. Uh, while some of the federal films, the Commonwealth Unit, were, Film Unit, were a little more artful, um, in the, the Tasmanian Film Unit, they were, they were very much utilitarian films. The unit's assignment was largely to fulfill requests for productions from other government departments, including the Education Department, the Tourism Department, and also uh, the Forestry Commission. But one of the key bodies that they were representing in terms of filmmaking was the Hydroelectric Commission, um, which will uh, be relevant when I get onto talking about the Franklin River um, campaign films. But in some ways, the films that were made for the tourism department are some of the most interesting to look at. And this is because correspondence between the Australian Tourism Commission and the TDFP in 1970 indicates that films made to promote capital investment in Tasmania were occasionally also deemed suitable for tourism publicity. On the flip side, there are numerous examples of films made specifically for the Department of Tourism that aestheticized the presence of industry in the landscape. Made in 1970, Tasmania's Road West is a rich example of this. It shows how extraction was valorized as not only wealth creation, 
but also by 1970 as part of the character and experience of Tasmania as a tourist attraction. So this is a bit of a gem of a film, I think. Uh, it's a 12 minute, 16 millimeter film featuring two young women driving through Western Tasmania in their Renault. One is a tourism information officer from Melbourne and the other has been asked to show her the sites on the West Coast. So this is a scripted documentary. Um, the Melbourne visitor with her Rioc camera in hand stands in as the viewer's surrogate. The casting of the two women as the protagonists serves to highlight the ease of this tourist experience and its broad public appeal. So they meet a wallaby along the way and take a journey on the placid waters of the Gordon River. A greater portion of the trip, however, is focused on mining and hydro sites, past and present. So I'd like to just show a short clip from this film so you can get a sense of the style and, and uh, what it is. So I will just try and make this work seamlessly. Okay, that seems good. This is exciting, all these old houses and verandas and things, just like the Wild West. This is where we are, in the real Wild West. You can spend a week here and still only see a fraction of what there is to be seen. Down there. They're like toys from up here. That hole down there was once the core of Mount Lyell. The Mount Lyell Company mined something like two and a quarter million tons of copper ore a year from this cut. Oh, they're going to start! I would have liked to stay a bit longer in Queenstown. Where are we off to next? A small harbour called Strawn. It's fairly close to Queenstown. But before we have a look at Strawn, I want to show you Ocean Beach first. Why, isn't Strawn on the open sea? No, you'll see why in a moment. This is Strawn? That's right. You'll see more of it when we get back. Okay, so <clears throat> yeah, there's so much to say about this film. Like, I don't have time to go into too much detail, but you know, the way that they've chosen two women to uh, to undertake the road trip, and you know, why they've decided to spend time underground in a mine. And anyway, yep, happy to talk about that. Perhaps a bit more when we finish. Uh, so the film places the women, um, the places the women visit, sorry, include several industrial sites that are already tourist attractions or destinations. In this respect, the film makes use of the ongoing currency of the visual wonder of mining and hydro. They also uh, pass a large hydro dam uh, at the end of the 1960s. The film, as a scripted narrative, is a mix of fiction and non-fiction, a, a style typical of promotional travel logs. 
The travelogue uh, is a broad category of film established in the early 20th century that includes examples that convey an emphasis on location as well as movement. Tasmania's Road West knits together sites of pristine nature and areas significantly altered by industry into a single sequence of attractions. In keeping with an established tra travelogue convention, industrialized modernity is deemed a tourist attraction. It's deployed in the service of celebrating the twinned attractions of pioneering colonial heritage and the vision of large scale present day environmental transformation. While archives hold no detail about where this particular film was distributed, at this time, the Tasmanian film departments, it made its films available for sale to schools, television broadcasters and libraries across Australia. Titles made for the Department of Tourism could also be used around the world by travel agencies in hotel rooms and on tour boats if they were distributed by the Tourist Commission. I suspect that Tasmania's Road West was largely made for to uh, promote domestic and tour domestic tourism, but it could have been sent as a package uh, to other countries as well, or tour boats, cruise ships. So as a film specifically made for promoting tourism, Tasmania's Road West is compelling as an example that shows how practices and values of extraction permeated the cultural and film lexicon. Yet its moment of production also casts it as a film that was only just in step with historical change. When the film was made in 1970, the wider Australian nation affirming project for sponsored documentary had diminished, particularly at federal level. Film institutions and cultural expectations were changing. The idea of a unif unified and homogenous nation, uh, which was, which kind of underpinned um, the Commonwealth Film Unit, were already being thrown into question, but Tasmania uh, was slightly behind in this respect. So the 1970s were also to become, of course, the decade in which environmentalism gathered momentum and ways of valuing nature started to shift. By 1982, this had resulted in the declaration of the UNESCO Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area in a region adjacent to the sites depicted in Tasmania's Road West. Of course, the campaign to save the Franklin River from a series of hydro dams was pivotal to this. The high point of the campaign is known for its investment in wilderness as a visual story storytelling device, largely through the notoriety of a single photograph. Peter Dombrovskis's 1979 Morning Mist Rock Island Bend, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. But as I've noted, there was also a role for the moving image, not just still photography. The idea of the Wild River was elaborated in a handful of films in a way that supported the Franklin campaign from its very beginnings. The films pursued a slightly different idea of wilderness and followed a different strategy to the, the still photography. So The Last Wild River, which is a film, the first film that, um, that was made, I'll, I'll start by talking about that. Uh, but first I want to note that the Franklin is a major perennial river stretching through the central highlands and western regions of Tasmania. It is 129 kilometres in length and largely flows through remote and rugged wooded mountainous terrain, making it uh, difficult to access by road. And this particular geography is crucial to the films that were made and how they functioned in the campaign. So from what I can tell, The Last Wild River documents the earliest rafting expedition down the river equipped with a film camera. So this 30 minute 16 millimeter film was a very early concerted step in the Franklin campaign. Paul Smith, a forestry worker at the time, was the instigator of the film. Smith, Bob Brown, Rick Rolls, Peter Thompson and Amanda or Sam Stark, all members of the Launceston Walking Club took the multi-day trip down the river 
with the idea to show what would be lost with the construction of the dams. This was before uh, the construction had actually been announced. But, but it's not an advocacy film in the way we would uh, you know, easily recognize. And I'll come back to that point, which I think is really interesting. In the early days of the campaign, the last Wild River, once it had been produced, toured not only around Tasmania, but also different parts of Australia with community screenings and town halls and churches organized by the Tasmanian Walking uh, Wilderness Society in a bid to highlight the value of the river via the experience of traversing it by raft. Audiences would have viewed the film in these contexts on 16 millimeter projection. They also paid $800 to have the film broadcast on Tasmania's two commercial television channels. From the time the film was produced, it was a key part of an intensive strategy to garner state and national attention. The film was motivated, motivated by the threat posed to the river region, but production and circulation were supported by a confluence of two further historical coincidences. The first is the introduction of colour television two years earlier in 1975 in Tasmania and the recent availability of consumer grade rubber rafts. The television broadcast was crucial and its impact was heightened by the fact that it could be broadcast in colour and Bob Brown has talked about this, the, the, the impact of the colour broadcast uh, in people's living rooms. Uh, and without the relative stability of rubber rafts, it wouldn't have been possible to take the 16 millimeter Bolex camera and film stock down the river. Okay, so what, what actually was in the film? So bookended by the beginning and ending of the river journey, The Last Wild River takes the form again of a travel film. Uh, told from the perspective of the rafters. So I'll elaborate a little more, but first I'll uh, show a clip from the film. Another day of wilderness travel begins. We shoot the rapids whichever way we can. While not as fast as canoes, rubber rafts are relatively stable, so it doesn't always matter if you can't see where you're going. Easy stretches like this give us time to appreciate the surrounding forest. We see myrtle, leatherwood, and the graceful Huon pines, which enticed the pines here last century. major obstruction is a log jam, where we disembark to find a suitable portage route. This log looks as though it'll provide a good starting point. We're glad the river level is unusually low, otherwise this log would be submerged and we'd have to take a more difficult route through the scrub. A portage involves at least two trips for each person to carry a raft and its contents around the obstacle. A very time-consuming operation, even for a short haul like this. A 
A peaceful canyon takes us to the Loddon River junction. After this, the Franklin passes through an extended series of gorges, bringing unexpected bends and rapids, which are a constant surprise and delight, even for an old hand like Bob. Okay, so yeah, that's uh, the last wild river. So I think it's it's in, in many ways not surprising that with little or no prior experience in filmmaking, um, that the filmmakers decided to make a travel log again. Uh, it's a mode that instinctively allows for an elaboration of place in narrative form. Jeffrey Ruoff observes that since early cinema, travelogues have exploited the play between education and pleasure. And I think this is a really interesting uh, little conjunction for this film. The pleasure that The Last Wild River offers is certainly linked to the presentation of scenic nature and how to navigate it. But education is, is very important to the film's address as well. The adventurer tourist is central to the aesthetic and to the educational tone of the film. The film's address to the viewer revolves around instructions about how to undertake the river journey, including instructions on rafting and portaging as relevant, as well as references to natural formations that the, 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 uh, the raft is a kind of naming as they go. The difficulty of the trip is clear, despite the film's kind of breezy tone that comes with, with the music largely, I think. Um, this visual presentation, however, is brought alive by the interplay between the movement and colour brought by the rafters and the variation of the river landscape. The most vibrant colours in the film are provided by the orange rafts and even the brighter orange life vests worn by the group. The eye cannot help but be drawn immediately to the people in the frame, whether mid-shot or dwarfed by cliffs of a steep gorge. The film proceeds through a rhythm of alternating stillness and movement as the group variously paddled through serene, secluded parts of the river and turbulent rapids in the bright summer sun. Rafting opened the Franklin up to more people and the film served to both show the beauty of the Franklin and the new recreational pursuit of the river rafting trip, the Franklin River Rafting Trip. From this time onwards, rafting becomes a key signifier in the construction of the Wild River, and I would say wilderness, with the journey promoted to conservationists, politicians, and reporters as a way for them to fully comprehend the river's value. The notion of wilderness promoted in this film and the ones that follow is distinct because it's shaped not simply by the idea of uh, untouched, pristine nature outside of human civilization, but rather by the authenticity of an arduous experience that's, that is part of the immersion, immersion in this nature. So the key point of identification for the viewers is not the unpeopled landscape, but rather the rafter and the frame and their sensory perception. This is a crucial distinction between the wilderness photography um, yeah, and the moving image uh, depictions. So The Last Wild River utilized a filmic lexicon, including color and movement, to convey both the challenges and beauty of, most importantly, an embodied experience. Given the longstanding consensus of sponsored documentary, this was also effectively a move that refashioned Southwest Tasmania in sound and image, for a wide audience, shifting away from practices of extraction and towards the use value of wilderness as recreation. Okay, so in a broader context, the last Wild River was a strategic and well-crafted depiction of wilderness made quickly by non-professional filmmakers with the intention to persuade and instruct 
in the particular context that I've just outlined. While this inaugural example is entirely dedicated to the river journey as a structuring device, the films that followed used the motif of the rafting journey either as a substantive or uh, lesser representational device. And, but always as a kind of shorthand indicator of the wilderness experience. And there is a list of the films uh, that I've been able to find that followed that, that used the rafting journey. This wider grouping of films functioned as an axis, axis connecting environmental awareness and a quickly evolving culture of film institutions and filmmakers in the 1970s. Looking closely at this body of films is a really interesting indicator of what was going on in Australian film culture and what was about to happen. As the Franklin River and the impending threat of hydro dams gained visibility in the national public sphere, filmmakers were drawn to Southwest Tasmania. A number of these, such as Bob Connolly, Michael Cordell and Joe Connor and Rolf de Heer, became prominent figures in the Australian film industry in the decades to follow. The production particulars of these films gesture to the shifting terrain of public and institutional interest between 1976 and 1980. In 1976, the last Wild River was supported by local conservation and bushwalking groups um, and was a low budget amateur film. In comparison, Cordell's The Franklin Wild River, also featuring Bob Brown, while crediting the Tasmanian Wilderness Society, also received funds from the Australian Film Commission, uh, which had been established five years prior. And um, Bob Connolly's Franklin River Journey is a very highly produced film, um, I think shot on 35 mil. The corpus of Franklin Films indicates a new interest in and support for independent filmmaking with environmental or conservation goals. This idea should be understood against the backdrop of the reinvigoration of film culture in the 1970s. Not only did the feature film industry take off at this time, but documentary production moved from being largely the concern of government or industry film units, and from the late 1950s television, um, as Fitzsimmons at all note, to be taken up by a younger generation of writers, directors, who were busy making observational and short trigger films designed as discussion starters for political issues. There was also investment in experimental film funding, film schools and university courses, fostering a new generation of film and media practitioners. So in some way or another, these films all tie into that culture, which I don't have time to elaborate on detail here. Um, but the move from the support of extraction industries in Tasmania's Road West to the Franklin River films of the early 80s, I argue, owes much to not only a greater interest in wilderness and environmental awareness, but also a more varied film culture and the rise of an ind independent sector. Okay, so to conclude, <clears throat> While the nation's feature film revival was preoccupied with the art cinema potential of combining colonial period drama and the aesthetic of the Australian bush, another film practice was formulating a different kind of audiovisual heritage in collaboration with the natural world. Within the realm of documentary, the 1970s should be understand, understood less as a moment of revival and more one of cultural adjustment a move from one culture to another. Government and industrial documentary thrived in the post-war decades in comparison to the low volume of local feature production. This documentary had for decades celebrated the spectacle of technological intervention, the capacity to extract value from the environment. I do wonder whether in a peculiar twist, it's quite possible that the documentary vision of mid-century Australia that worked to show one part of the country to another had, by the 1960s and 70s, added fuel to the growth of environmental movements as the reshaping of the continent became visible to, and perhaps alarmed, a new generation, inspired by what they were seeing 
uh, in environmental movements internationally. In other words, it may be that while films sought to engage the nation in the progress and wealth sustained by bountiful nature, some read against the grain and saw what was to be lost in the encroachment of agriculture, mining and forestry into areas that were valued as wilderness. Um, and before I finish, I'd like to just gesture to a new project uh, that is, uh, I'm trying to seed at the moment that's being developed out of some of the archival work um, in the one in the, the larger um, discovery project that I noted at the outset. And this project is one that seeks to look at Australia's 20th century energy expansion or a kind of energy imaginary as a visual promotional culture. So includes documentary, um, but also photography, uh, fine art photography especially, and other kinds of audio visual products that were used as public relations and pro promotional um, culture throughout the, the throughout the 20th century. And I think there's a lot more to talk about there with uh, the Snowy Mountain Hydro Project, uh, other kinds of corporate filmmaking, especially the Shell Film Unit, and how fossil fuels became um, our dominant form of energy and how much uh, kind of public relations, but also creative practice um, from different uh, creative uh, professionals who were employed by industry to develop a particular kind of visual appeal to their corporate industrial activity. So I'm happy to talk more about that if people are interested, but otherwise I will uh, finish there. Thank you so much.